Good evening, everybody, and welcome from New Canaan Library. I'm Anthony Maricola, Manager of Adult Services and Programming, and I hope that you're all doing well this evening. Uh, we have a wonderful program for you. Um, um, tonight, we're very, very happy to welcome Gus Moreno. He's the author of This Thing Between Us. His stories have appeared in Aurealis, Pseudopod, Blue Stem Magazine, and the Burnt Tongues Anthology. He lives in the suburbs with his wife and dogs, but he never thinks that he's not from Chicago for one second. Gus will be discussing his debut novel, this Thing Between Us, an electrifying thriller with an infusion of otherworldly happenings. The New York Times has been quoted as saying, you don't want to read this book before bed. Copies of This Thing Between Us by Gus Marino are available locally um, in New Canaan at um, Elm Street for, your, for you to purchase. Um, Gus, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Oh, thank you for having me. You know, first, I'd like to say that I, I enjoyed everything about this novel. Um, you know, it was a horror novel, but it was also so much more, you know, it presented the reader with themes of love, grief, politics, immigration, and culture. Uh, and to the, the reader, the novel feels very personal and intimate. Um, what inspired you to write the novel? You know, there were two, I would say two things that came uh, with the like genesis of the novel. The first thing was, um, I always had this idea for writing a haunted house story, but a, a haunted house story that just dealt with like contemporary technology. Um, I was always like slightly annoyed when, you know, uh, books or movies pretend like cell phones don't exist or there's no such thing as Google and you can't just like take a photo of something on your phone. Um, and I was always jealous of, I think it's Paranormal Activity 4, where they use the Xbox Connect to like track a ghost in the room. I, I just thought that was genius. So I was like, okay, I wanna write a horror novel that utilizes contemporary technology. And you know, without a second thought, the first thing I was like, well, obviously a smart speaker has to be like the mouthpiece to whatever is going to be haunting the house. Uh, but I couldn't, I just couldn't get like the engine of the story together. Um, I, yeah, you know, I only had that, that piece. So I kind of just, sat the story on a back burner. And what ended up happening was I lost someone very close to me. Um, my sister-in-law, Carol, who, you know, sister-in-law doesn't cover uh, what she meant to me. She was like the matriarch of my generation and my family. So I, I was just absolutely devastated. Um, and I really lost the will to write fiction. Uh, I just couldn't go, you know, into like, into my head and just deal with like imaginary people when I was just dealing with this great loss. So the only thing I, I could think to do was just to write my feelings, if that makes sense. Um, just every day, I would just, I would just jot down what I was thinking, what I was feeling, just to keep up that uh, routine of writing every day. Like if I'm not writing fiction, at least I'm writing something. And, you know, after a few weeks of that, I looked back at my notes and I was really surprised by, by the tone and the voice in, in the notes. And uh, just also in the, you know, all of my notes were written to Carol. So that's where the, that's where the you stuff comes from. Um, Cause I was, I was just talking to her in my notes. So I felt like, okay, I wanna keep writing this way, but I need, I need some type of lattice to, to hang these thoughts and these feelings. So I, I just went back to my old, you know, story idea folder and saw the, the haunted smart speaker. And I was like, oh, I think, I think I can make these two things work. Um, so it was literally just, just putting those two things together and, and just taking it from there, just, just writing the story um, out from that point on. No, and, and you, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, um, but you can you can really feel that 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 intimacy was was coming through. It it felt real, um, and you know, it not 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 every author can do that and make it feel genuine, and and it really did. Um, you know, you so your novel, you know, at least it, to me, it felt both intimate and real. But you know, as a reader, you don't really know it's real. Um, you know, Thiago's grieving, and and you made these characters that you know, I feel like the reader gets really attached to. And, you know, you just strap us in for this roller coaster because we don't know what's real and what isn't in certain aspects. And that couldn't have been easy. Um, you know, was, was your intention from the start to take the, 
the the reader on this this roller coaster, um, or did it just gradually uh, evolve? Oh, and I love um, the roller coaster feeling of a, of a book of a story in general. I, I just I love that feeling of you know getting lulled into a story, and then when the craziness starts to happen, you sort of look around in this in this fictional world and realize like there are no exits like you're you're stuck and you just have to like go on it that's my favorite type of a uh, story experience and uh that's how i write I, I love that like feeling of a gauntlet where you're you're just going through it um that's my favorite quality when it comes when it comes to writing my favorite movies kind of like have that feeling too um and I think I guess the point of writing for me is just to to write something as if I'm saying like this is how I feel like do you feel the same way so like emotion and and feeling really do uh, play big factors in in my writing so yeah like I knew you know I knew that stuff going in that like it was going to be a roller coaster I just I just didn't know a lot of what the roller coaster was going to be. Um, you know, some things I had plotted out, you know, I, because it's me, I knew a dog would make it in sooner or later. Um, you know, I, funnily enough, like I had the wall before I had the cook it, cause it's just a matter of just like bringing things into the world, into your book. I, I it's so funny how you, you know, once you start writing that initial idea just becomes like this, like wad of bubble gum and, as you go through your life, like things just start sticking to it. Um, like for instance, I, I, I listened to a podcast, um, I think, and it was about, it was about a woman who contracts rabies and she falls into a coma and her significant other is at the hospital and he has his hand in her hand and he feels her fingers start to like rub against his palm. So he starts asking your questions and it seems to be that she's answering in these like rubbing uh, motions. So like for after like hours of this, they, they kind of develop um, an alphabet to like talk to, to use to communicate through. So like once they get this figured out, the first sentence she puts together, the first message he can decipher is her saying, pull me out of the wall. And when I heard that, it like it made like all the hairs on my on my body stand. No context whatsoever. Like I, you know, it wasn't coming from a horror story. But when I heard, but the idea of someone in a coma to describe their coma as being stuck in a wall, it it did something to me that I, immediately I was like, that that's going in. I don't know how. I don't know why, but that's going in because that just you know, initiated this crazy feeling that I must now include in my book. So I, like it, things work like that for me as far as like, you know, including things in the book, I'm not really cognizant of what's going to be in the book until it's, until it's written. Yeah. No. And what I appreciated about Thiago was that he was, uh, you know, you watch so many horror movie, mo movies and it's this like super hyper-masculinized, you know, male character. And I appreciated that he was, he was so human and warm and, you know, it was a, a, a man grieving and in love, you know, and it, 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 it did, it, it had such, it had that, like, he, he was just so warm and kind and, you know, you felt his loss um, and, you know, you felt horrible that he had to go through all the things that he did, but regardless, like he still did it, you know, like, he's like, this is what I have to do. I'm going to do it. I, I don't enjoy it. I know that it, it's probably going to break me, but I'm still going to do it and I'm going to, you know, do the best that I can. Yeah, yeah, I think it it goes back just to like, I think uh, you know hero ar hero archetypes that I that I really enjoy. I'm also like, you know, I I love a good uh, machismo type story. I'm I'm a huge professional wrestling fan, so don't get me started on machismo and and like yeah, that yeah. type of uh, stereotype. But like when it comes to fiction, like I, I need something more. So. Um, it, it's really like that that's the work for me is like marrying these two worlds of, of genre and of just you know like this like hard-hitting emotion that you get 
in like a, a lot of other different genres. I, I think because, you know, it's horror, you get stuck on, on this feeling of like one kind of horror that, and it's, and it's the like, it's the terror, it's fear, it's, it's a being afraid of the unknown. And I think there's just, there's all, there are a lot more facets to horror that we, we don't even realize are, would make us afraid. Um, so that's really where I like to like explore uh, things. Yeah. And I, I think that we all get scared differently too, right? There's certain, there's certain horror that I, that I really enjoy. And then there's other that I don't so much because I know that it's not going to scare me as much. And, you know, it's funny because I came to your novel, my, my colleague who, um, <clears throat> my, another librarian that I work with, he had your book on, on the desk and I, I saw the cover, right? And I thought the cover was amazing. Like it was just so unique to me, that cover. Um, and, you know, I try not to judge books by their cover because, you know, a lot of times the cover is so amazing, right? And then you read the book and you're a little disappointed because you built what that cover is in, you know, in your mind. And, you know, yours totally like lived up to that. Now, how did the, like, did you have, um, do you have input into the, into the cover design? You know, I, I did. I, it wasn't like, what do you want? And, and I, I told them the cover that is now on the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no world where I describe that cover. Um, the only things I could come up with was like, I, I don't want any characters to be represented on the cover. Um, yeah, no, 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 no problem. Um, what I was on though, I forgot now. <laughs> oh, we were talking about the cover. Oh yes, the cover. So it was like, I just, I, I don't want any characters represented on the, on the cover. I just want something that is a, I just want colors that contrast. Mm -hmm. And I just want, I want distinct shapes. That, that's all I really gave. I, I wanted something abstract. I didn't want anything that people could take as like, oh, that, that is this in the book. Um, so there was the, the cover is literally the first cover that they showed me. They were like, he, how about this? And I was like, you nailed it. <laughs> you absolutely nailed uh, the book just because like it, it, re it draws you in, um, which is something I, I could not have planned for or, or even known to ask. So the cover is just fantastic. I like to say I had any input in it feels weird because it was, uh, Sarah Wood, who who designed the cover, and um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on Howie Wonder. Howie Wonder did the actual art of the the white and black and and the dog. Um, so I mean, it was that it was all it was all them. I'm I'm just the author who gets to claim it uh, as his book cover. Yeah, no, it 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 was perfect, and it it. Reminds me of um, it reminds me of uh, uh, this abstract expressionist um, Matthew uh, Barney who did um, or Barnett Newman I apologize and he would do these giant massive scale uh, color form paintings with one slither of of light in them and he used to call it like this this line of sublime and it it you know it it that's how it felt it was that one slither that was going to pull you in um, and it, it really it it hit the mark with that um, it, it was really awesome. Um, now, in talking about inspirations, um, you know, when I when I when I was reading the book, I and I had I had told you this earlier that the 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 creep show too, the 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 vignette of of the the segment with the raft, where you know the 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 one guy's on this raft and his tar is is grabbing encapsulating all of them, and there's this one person left and he thinks he's made it off of the off of that raft, and as soon as he gets off, you know, the tar pulls him back in. Um, did you know? I felt some Stephen King nods throughout the book, um, and I mean that very respectfully. Um, who are some of your um, favorite authors and and some of the your favorite books? Oh wow, so many to choose from. I would say some like foundational novels for me um, that really shaped, I guess, who I am as as like a writer. Um, one, the first, the the book that got me to be a writer is uh, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. I you know I read that in high school and changed everything for me it it hit me in a time where you know books and movies and music hit you in a certain way and and that book like changed everything for me so um huge impact on me i would say let's see other books uh, fight club by chuck palahniuk is another one um and then as i as i got older i really got into books by um lucia berlin and amy hempel short story writers 
um, but also Margaret Atwood, I just started falling in love with the construction of sentences and just making prose that that feels casual, but like they're using they're using casual language to describe feelings that there is no word for. Um, I, I absolutely loved that, just the style of using everyday words to describe indescribable things and, and to describe indescribable moments, just these little like slices of life. That, that, those were like so impactful for me. Um, but then I guess on the other side, on the story side, I was really gravitating towards you know, American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis, um, Battle Royale, who the name of the Japanese writer I am blanking on, but Battle Royale is, is an absolutely phenomenal book. It, it was Hunger Games before Hunger Games um, and, and before Divergent was Divergent. It, it's like the, the, first, the first one of uh, murderous middle school kids stuck somewhere trying to like survive. Um, and, and it's a spectacular novel, spectacular. So those are like some of my favorite books. Uh, I guess most of my favorite books either fall under like beautiful sentences or horrific stories. That that's those are my lanes, and and I like to like stick in them. Um, now, how that. did your how did your writing career start? Um, with yeah, yeah. So oddly enough, um, I guess it started in while I was in college. Um, Chuck Palahniuk has his own website. And one year he, he got on the message boards and he was like, you know, like, let's, let's do this project where, where we'll develop a, a workshop, a writing workshop. And each month the moderators will select the top stories and I will, Chuck, Chuck Palahniuk will critique those stories. Um, and then, you know, maybe somewhere down the line, we would make an anthology of, of the stories that were selected. So he had made this announcement. I was a senior in college and I thought, you know, I, I wanted, I knew before then I wanted to be a writer, but when this opportunity came up, I was like, oh, this is it. This is the, this is the thing. So, you know, I immediately started critiquing stories and, and writing as many stories as I could to submit. And um, I ended up getting four short stories critiqued by Chuck. So, wow. Yeah, so it was, I mean, that was my goal. Like just yeah. to get him to read my story was like the number one goal for me. For him to like actually like one of my stories and to include it in an anthology was beyond what I could have imagined. So I would say those were really like my the first steps into writing when I was like, oh wow, if if I can get Chuck Palahniuk to like one of my stories, maybe, um, you know, I, sh I should keep, I should keep on doing this. I should keep on going. So, you know, I, I wrote short stories. Um, all of my short stories really revolved around, I guess, like literary kind of like Raymond Carver type stories, but with a, a dark edge to them, they would, they would like lean into horror or lean into the transgressive, but, you know, wouldn't go all the way. Um, and I found that it was getting harder and harder for me to write because I didn't know what I wanted to write. I just felt like I had no direction. So I decided, okay, maybe I should just focus on a genre. Like a genre will give me parameters for me to like play with. And I just, you know, looked at my work, saw where I was going and just thought like, oh, uh, horror. Like, I, I think I could fit in horror. Was not a big horror reader at this time. I uh, would not call myself a horror fan because I'm actually afraid of horror. Like <laughs> I, I read horror, I watch horror. I'm a scaredy cat. Like I, I don't, I'm, I don't read it and watch it unaffected. Like it, it does affect me. So I just assumed like, oh, maybe I can't be a horror writer then. Um, but it was really like just, just working on it, writing, and then hearing a, an interview with Stephen Graham Jones where he described how like he can be so prolific because he just wants to get the stories out of his head because he doesn't want to spend time with them that I was like oh okay if, if he can admit his fear maybe maybe I can do this too maybe it's okay for me to write and be scared while I'm writing so so that was really what got me into horror and you know once I made that decision people really connected with the writing, uh, which, which was very surprising to me. And 
with this thing between us, it, it's so odd how it really just takes one person. I, I pitched the book to maybe like eight agents. Um, only one agent liked the pitch and wanted to read the whole novel. And that became my agent, Annie Baumke. Uh, so like, then, then the ball got rolling again. You know, uh, she sent the book out to eight publishers, I think. Only one wanted to meet with me. And that became MCD Books. And that's the publisher I signed with. And they're the ones, you know, they, they put out the book. So it was always, it, it's such an odd experience because I, I don't think it's an experience many other writers have where like, I, I really didn't have a lot of like pushback. There was, at each step, there was always one person who believed in the book. And it, it only ever took one person to get to that next level. So it's, it's surprising now to see that like, people are enjoying the book and, and I, I see the book out in the world. Like it's, it's the whole thing is very surreal. Yeah, it, it must be. Um, and I, you know, had another, a, a question on here about, you know, the book has received a lot of great reviews. I mean, NPR gave it a rave review. I mean, it's, it seems like it's, it's really popular. Now, how does creating a su successful novel change your life? Like, you know, now, like what's different now, now that you, you know, is anything different? Um, yeah, my time is, is different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just because, I mean, now, yeah, I, I think I think now it's like, oh, the, the world knows I want to be a writer. So now it's like the world's like, we'll prove that you're a writer. Um, so like, it, it's, it's become now, I mean, maybe it's just I was lazy before that like now I'm like, oh, I have to work. I actually have to work at this writing thing. Um, so I, I would say like the the output of work maybe the thing that changed the most. But um, I mean, everything else is still the same. My my nieces and nephews could care less if, if I was a writer. Like, you know, my dogs still uh, want to go outside and play. They don't care. So like, I, I really don't feel much of a difference, I guess. That's funny. Um, now, to, to what extent did your personal experiences with culture and background uh, play a role in the novel for you? Um, you know, I, I saw this in the, 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 the story you did, Survive, that's in the Burnt Tongues anthology, which is another uh, great story. So if you guys haven't read it, you know, please do. It's, it's actually a really great anthology. Um, but did, did culture play a role um, you know, personally um, into what you put into the novel? You know, I think it's just something I can't not write, if that makes sense. Uh, for, for the longest time, I, I really avoided writing about culture just because I was a little, I was a little jealous of the fact that someone like, you know, James Cameron can make Terminator and you don't have to spend the entire time justifying why the Terminator is Austrian. Like, it's just accepted. Like, it, it, that's, that's just the way it is. So like, I, I also wanted to write stories where, you know, I, I wanted to write a story of like a Mexican Terminator and you don't have to worry about why he's Mexican. Um, so, so really that, that, that was like something I pushed against. And it wasn't until I just kept writing more that I could see that like, for whatever reason, I keep coming back to these themes and it's just because that's my life. Those are the things that I deal with. So I usually, you know, like I, I can't avoid those topics. I can't avoid writing about my culture or writing about um, the clash between, you know, Mexican culture and American culture and growing up in between those things. So really what I do now is just, I just try to find ways of including them in the story that I want to write. So, you know, you, things like Survived and This Thing Between Us, a lot of a lot of my writing deals with grief and uh, culture. No clue why. I I couldn't tell you why those are the th like why grief is such a, a big thing for me. I mean, there is a I have an unpublished novella that is about like a zombie apocalypse after the apocalypse, like more about like the cleanup it. involved, and it it's just dripping with grief. This was before Carol passed. This was before any like major losses in my life. I don't know why I go back to those things. Um, but, but yeah, like that, that's just my wheelhouse, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, a question that was frequently coming to my mind when I was reading the novel, I was like, if Tiago could speak and understand Spanish more fluently, 
would he have discovered the answers to end the, the chaos sooner? You know, yeah. and I, I think it was, it was I, at least I thought it was a really clever way to include the, include culture in there. Um, because it, it, you know, he was, he was ma married into a family that was really strong in their culture. Um, and, you know, I, I sometimes wonder that if, if he would have been able to understand, maybe, maybe things might have been a little, a little different. But um, it's, I mean, for the novel, it was probably good that he didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I bet, uh, I bet if he knew Spanish, uh, Fidelia maybe would have, would have cut him some slack. But I, I think yeah, because yeah. she, like, she was toying with him that she was just having like too much fun and I, th I think too like I you don't see much about um I guess um people of color also in conflict with their own cultural background um I, I think you know you see a, if there's a story about you know a, a Mexican family then they're proud Mexicans and and like they deal with the same the tried and true uh, mainstream topics of, let's say, like uh, of immigration, of class, of poverty, like the same types of stories. When I just I wanted to write stories about, you know, the culture that affects me of of being stuck between worlds, of not really having a place of your own, of the those weird situations where you're where someone thinks you know Spanish and you don't want to admit that you don't know Spanish, but you try to like work your way through, like those are the kind of experiences that I enjoy uh, writing about because I, I live them. Would you we'd be honored if you would read a little bit of your, your book for us? Um, would you be willing to do that for us? Oh yeah, sure, not a problem. All right. So this is a little um, towards the beginning where Tiago and Vera have started to experience strange phenomenon and they're trying to get to the bottom of it. So they call um, the seller's real estate agent. Um, I'm gonna throw on my glasses for this. All right. Calling the real estate agent was your idea. Not our agent, but the seller's. We kind of knew who the seller was, but getting in contact with him was impossible. Our brownstone was one of a handful of properties this guy owned in Pilsen. And it was easy to spot his buildings because the exteriors were all painted the same beige color with black trim and black vinyl window frames. The other properties housed businesses and were run by building managers who weren't about to offer up his name and direct phone number. The guy didn't show up for our closing, so even if we knew his name, we wouldn't know his face. We kept the paperwork from the closing in an empty UGG shoebox under our bed and sitting cross-legged on the bedroom carpet, papers forming concentric circles around you you found the real estate agent's name and agency. Still, I didn't think he would help. If we wanted to bitch about the property, he was probably going to tell us to talk to the inspector, not him. Then let him tell us no, you said. We're the ones stuck here, Tiago. We have to at least try. You put this phone on speaker and set it on the counter, and we both listened to it ring. He picked up and you introduced yourself giving him our address and telling him we met at the condo closing. He sounded apprehensive. You asked if he could tell us anything about the history of the building before it was rehabbed. Did something happen here? Was there anything weird about the space? We stared at the phone, waiting for him to say something. Why do you ask, he finally said. The cold spots you had been walking through? It felt like one of them had passed through me as we stood there. My internal organs felt jumbled into the wrong spots. Because we've been experiencing things, you said, the mix of fear and adrenaline making the whites of your eyes pop. I know this sounds crazy. It's just, I'm sorry, ma'am, but any problems with appliances should have been brought up at the closing. No, you're not hearing me. His voice got far away, like he was shifting the phone off his shoulder to end the call. Please refer to the contract. You said if that was the same contract requiring the seller to disclose any defects with the property to the buyer, like our water pipe leaking into the unit below us and how the downstairs neighbors told us they had repeatedly asked the agent's client to fix it, but he never did. And maybe the agent didn't know about this pre-existing problem, but maybe he did. Excuse me? But you blurted something about fiduciary responsibility in small claims court and that shut him up. We both looked at each other. 
next thing he said was, hold on a sec. The sound of wind cutting across the receiver suddenly disappeared, followed by a sharp thump. Sorry, just getting into my car. He took a deep breath. Look, I can reach out to Mr. Groff and see if he knows anything, but I don't think he'll be much help. He isn't much of a hands-on guy when it comes to tenants. But I toured the building with him after the last unit cleared, the unit you purchased. An elderly woman had been living there for ages. No one knew quite how long. She was very upset about being forced to move. I don't know whether she did this in retaliation or if this was just how she was living, but the unit was filthy. There was garbage piled in the corners. The toilet and the tub were backed up. The smell was intolerable. The line went quiet. You looked at each other again. Hello, you said. Did we lose you? In the living room was a circle of melted candles, he said. In the center of it was an animal carcass. You don't really know how hard it is to identify an animal without fur or skin. Your hands flew up to your mouth. Oh my God. The agent kept talking. He said on the wall facing the carcass was a large rectangular shape drawn in blood. What do you mean? It looked like a giant door, he said. I don't know. I told Mr. Groff to call the police. This was obviously animal cruelty, but I think he just hired a couple guys to come in and clean it all up before the demo started. Are you still there? Something in the living room caught my eye, a flash of movement. We both looked up and you extended your arm across my chest like we were about to rear end a car. A wave of white light slid across each surface. The hexagons glowed and then spun around, trying to locate our voices. Was she listening to us? Or had she been listening to us? It didn't matter. The hexagon spun another rotation and vanished. Whatever it was, it was too late to do anything about it. All right. Oh, that was amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now, how long did this novel take you to write? You know, it took maybe, it took maybe a year and a half for me to get it to a place where I could start pitching it to agents and uh, publishers. And then after that, it, it took about another, maybe another year and a half of just editing. And I think part of that was just, um, just scheduling, timing. So in, in total, maybe three years, but, but I wouldn't say three years of like constant writing. It's more like three, three years of just getting the book to a uh, publication. Now, how did editing change the novel? Were there any alternative um, endings? You know, there, there was a lot of, uh, of different stuff in the book. So the, I guess the way I go about writing is I like to, I like to include as much, as much stuff as I can get into a book just to make it as like, as insane as possible. And then I just start uh, like shaving it down, Sh shaving bits down until I get to this like core story. So what I, I end up having is I end up having like a lot of different things that just don't make it into the book. Um, and there were, there were a lot of, of things with this thing between us. I would say there was a whole, there was a whole third uh, at the end of the book that took place in Antarctica if that gives you like any idea of how wild the book would get. Um, it, it was kind of like the phases where, you know, Tiago starts in Chicago and then he ends up in the mountains of Colorado and then his final um, act of, of removing himself from the world would be to go to Antarctica to take one of those Nat Geo uh, tourist expeditions to Antarctica. But, you know, you know once I started writing that, it just became the thing, uh, like John Carpenter's a thing. And I was like, okay, this is, this is not what I'm trying to do. So like, I cut that out. There was something else. Um, oh, so there is, there is a, uh, I don't think it's a spoiler, but there is a, a point where Tiago reveals that the book that we are reading is, is like the letter that he is writing to his wife. Um, and there were, 
in, in previous drafts, you would also learn in that, in that draft that like the story that Tiago is telling is also like very old and, and that he has actually been dealing with this demon for decades and that he's, he's remarried multiple times. And like all of the wives have died because of this, this thing that just keeps following him. But I, you know, I just, I just couldn't make it work. It, I, I lost the, I lost the engine of, of just, that was like the engine that's in the book now where you just like zoom to the end um, with that revelation of, of like that Tiago is actually like writing from like a far further back present than, than you realize um, it, it just didn't work. So it was another thing that just got tossed out. Yeah, wow. It would, I'd be interested to, to read all of those, those, those pre-edited <laughs> versions. They sound amazing though. Um, now, uh, I'd like to add, invite the audience um, to ask any questions um, if, if they have, um, you know, whether it's about the novel or the writing process. Um, I'm sure Gus would be happy to answer those. Um, so um, I'll, as I keep asking questions, you know, please feel free to put those in the Q&A and I'll be happy to ask them. Um, so now what's next for you? You know, I know you might not be able to tell too much about what you're working on, but are there other novels in the works? There are. So I am working on a new novel. Um, I can't divulge too much because I mean, like, like, just like I, I said right now, I like to include a bunch of things into a book, like the same thing's going to happen with this second book where I'm going to include a whole bunch of stuff that will probably just get edited out. So I can't, I can't really say like what the book going to be about. Like there is, there is this core story of a family that goes to uh, what the Western mountains of North Carolina um, to finish hiking the Appalachian trail in honor of someone who's passed away <laughs> because I can't get away from grief. And while they're on the Appalachian trail, they they come into contact with vampires uh you know va vampires are a thing in this world and you know once the vampires make an appearance yeah all hell breaks loose so um that's gonna be the second book and you know i'm working on a bunch of other things uh i've got a short story in an, in an anthology coming out soon uh through mcd books uh not my anthology it's just one story of mine uh in, in a book with with other writers um so there'll be more on that soon and you know there there are a lot of things moving right now so um if anyone's like interested in in adaptations of this thing between us or other works of mine uh, just stay tuned because like there there's a lot happening Oh, that's wonderful. And, and, you know, you, you deserve it. It, it really was a, a great book. And, you know, the, the only thing that I wish was that, that there was more to read. I, I honestly, I wish you had like five more novels out so that I could just keep going through them. And I, I'm sure those who have read, who have read this thing between us feel the same way. Now, um, do you, it, I feel like the novel could have been adapted into a movie. Is there any talk about a film ad adaptation just yet? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's talk. <laughs> Yeah. There's, there's, there's a, there's a lot of talk and that's something I'm quickly realizing is like, just like talk is talk. Um, yeah, yeah. So like there, there's been, there's been interest. There have been like studios and production companies. Um, I, I've had a couple meetings, but like nothing has been signed. There has been like no like real, like deep talks. Like it's, it's all just like very preliminary stuff. So like, yeah, like, like the, things are moving, but then also like things are not moving. It, it kind of feels like the publishing world where it's just like, you, you know, nothing for long bouts of time and then everything within 10 minutes. Um, so I'm assuming like that's how movies are gonna be too. Yeah, but you know, you just, just keep, keep, you know, keep stay stay with it and I, I'm sure it will I'm sure it will happen um now Jose asked a question um did you pitch the novel uh to a publisher directly and I think you might have addressed this a little earlier but if you don't mind um just sure that was my initial idea my initial idea would be to pitch to a publisher um but I didn't do that um you know I I had this idea in my head of becoming a, a published writer where I would I would write a novel and I would pitch it to some like small indie publishers, get it published there. And, and then that's how I would get an agent um, because I've already written a novel. I, I thought that's how I was gonna go about things. And it was really just like 
a matter, you know, it was really just like, well, I should just, I should just pitch to agents right now. Like, it, you know, the worst they can say is no, you know, why, why not then? So that, that's really the only reason why I pitched to publishers first. I mean, to, uh, to agents first instead of publishers. And, and then I ended up kind of getting into like this weird mix up where like a, a publisher and an agent were all, were both interested. And I was like, oh, this was a bad idea. I wish I didn't do this. Um, so like, so, so yeah, yeah. I, I meant to go publisher first. I ended up going agent first. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, now, what what advice would you have for you know we have a lot of uh, a lot of writing programs at the library and a lot of uh, aspiring writers. What advice would you have for for a, a I mean a younger older anyone who just loves writing? Um, what advice would you have for them in, in in terms of how they can get better, how how they can be you know find their their become more creative, um, you know anything that works for you um, that you could you could you know help us yeah. with yeah so. For the longest time, I had my work, uh, I, I was in a like a writing workshop, which I think was such a big benefit to my writing, which was uh, being in a writing workshop, because it, it helped me develop uh, the skills to critique someone's work. And it also gave me a tough skin when it came to like having my work critiqued, because, you know, there it's a very vulnerable thing to like write something that you feel like carries a lot of emotion, carries your feelings. It may be a personal experience and you're, you're, you're giving it to someone. It, it's, it feels like it's a piece of you. And when someone is critical of that piece, you can take it very, very personally. Even when that person does not mean it, that person will literally give you criticism for the betterment of your story, but it kind of feels like they're like criticizing you. Um, so being in a workshop where I could like deaden the outrage that I was feeling towards people like not liking my work um, so the, to the point where I'm like, oh, okay, like someone can be critical of my writing and I don't die. Like, that's amazing. Like, you know, you get, get yourself to that level where like you're not so precious with, with your writing. I, I think that's the benefit of a writing group. But at the same time, there came a point where I was sending my, my work to my, my writer friends for critiques. And a part of me knew what they were going to, like what their criticism was going to be. Like I knew what the problems were when I sent the book. And then when I would get the critique, it would be the things I already knew were wrong with the book. And I, I kind of realized I just wasn't being honest with myself. And on some level, I was sending the, the story to them to see if I could get away with not writing the things I, I, I needed to write without like strengthening the weak points. Like that's actually what I was trying to do. That's, what, that's actually what I was using my writer friends for was like to see if like they saw the, the, the blind spot, the like weak spots. And they always did. So I just started realizing like, oh, I just, I just can't lie to myself. If I just stop lying to myself and just like iron out the parts that I feel like are weak, then I will have like the strongest story possible. And when someone reads it and offers criticism, it's going to be like real criticism because I've already taken care of like all of the, all of the weak points that I was able to see. So those were two big like learning factors for me um, because then once I started, once I started uh, ironing out the weak points for me, I became more confident in my writing. Um, so, so I would say those, those two things of just like find a couple people that, that you trust and will not chew your head off if you're critical of their work and to just don't just, don't lie to yourself and don't despair because there's, I know so many writers better than me who stopped for one reason or another. Um, another thing I used to tell myself was just like, there's so much crappy writing that gets published year after year. And it's because those writers just didn't quit. So, you know, in my head, I was like, okay, 
a way to deal with like imposter syndrome is like, if I suck, then if like, I, I might suck as a writer, I might not be a good writer, but if I don't stop writing sooner or later, I will get published because that's what crappy writers do. So that was just my idea. That was like, okay, I just won't stop writing. Um, I won't, I won't get upset about like people rejecting my work because sooner or later I will hit because that's what uh, crappy writers do. I, you know, that I guess that may be like pragmatic, but like that's, re that's really how I go about it. It's just like other people who, who I'm critical of do it. Why can't I? Um, so, so I guess that's like my advice. No, that, that, that was wonderful. Um, thank you for that. Now I have one last question and it's probably switching gears a little bit, but what is your favorite wrestling match ever? Oh my God. Thank you. Whoever uh, asked that question, favorite wrestling match ever. Oh, and that, that, that one was mine. Oh my God. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, favorite wrestling match ever. It would have to be I mean, you're putting you're putting me on the spot with, with this fantastic. Yeah, I, I know. I, I should I should have I should have added that one when I when I sent you the list over. Um, I, or maybe or maybe favorite dream match that didn't happen. Oh, favorite dream match that didn't happen would be uh, Sting in his prime versus The Undertaker in his prime. That that is like a dream match I would love to have to have seen. Yeah, that um, would have been amazing. It would have been amazing. Yeah, uh, favorite wrestling been, moment. Yeah, is when. Um, WCW and ECW are invading WWE so like all of those wrestlers are attacking all of the WWE wrestlers and at the time like Stone Cold Steve Austin had been out with an injury for months so like no one was even talking about him and just out of nowhere Stone Cold uh, appears and just starts beating the crap out of all of the ECW wrestlers WCW wrestlers um, backstage so by the time he actually gets to the ring you can't hear his music over the sound of the crowd just like losing their minds that uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin is there that is I get goosebumps watching that every now and every now and then if I'm like feeling like crappy I will like go to YouTube and I'll like I'll watch that like it's like Stone Cold Steve Austin invasion mm -hmm. and um it, it just makes me feel so much better. Like that's, yes, one of my favorite moments right there. Oh, that's wonderful. That should, that should have been your advice to writers when they're feeling down, <laughs> just watch that video. Um, yeah. Or yeah, just call no. me and then I'll just rip <laughs> everyone's butt. <laughs> um, Gus, thank you so much for being with us this evening. It was a, a real pleasure. Um, I'm so looking forward to what's next for you. Um, I can't wait to read the new novel. I hope there's a movie because I will be waiting in line to see it. Um, I wish you all the luck in all your, your next in, endeavors. And, and I really appreciate you, you know, spending your, your evening with us and the New Canaan community to, to tell us about your writing and your, your book. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. This was awesome. Like, th thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this, this was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Oh, thank you so much. Um, everybody from New Canaan and those who attended, um, have a lovely evening, and thank you for, for spending your evening with us. And uh, thank you again, Gus. We really appreciate it. For sure. Thank you. Bye. Good night.